an old guy who never got over a serious childhood bug addiction, I think. <laughs> <laughs> All right, noted. I can share my screen here. Is that showing up for you? Yes. You're, uh, you're sharing the uh, file screen and not the presentation view. There you go. Let me pull all of you over to the side here. Um, well, we skipped the front cover of the book that Steve and I did some years ago. <clears throat> but uh, speaking of, uh, didn't know what a damselfly is. Here is a photo of a dragonfly along with a damselfly. And you can see um, the uh, dragonfly has its eyes close together on the front of its head. They're widely separated on the damselfly. From the front, the damselfly looks a bit like a hammerhead shark. Um, the bodies you can see, dragonfly is a much thicker abdomen, a very robust. Fast flyer, damselfly is much more, uh, much smaller abdomen and more delicate. Uh, and they're not a real um, fast flyer like the damselflies. Usually flit along in the grass, and it's amazing uh, <clears throat> because they're a lot of them are brightly colored, but they easily disappear in the grass. Typical insects, you know, two pairs of wings, compound eyes, head, thorax, abdomen, six legs. And the uh, dragonflies, when they perch, they hold their wings out from their body. <clears throat> uh, damselflies hold their wings kind of back over their body. How many are there? People seem to always want to know that. Uh, currently, there's about 6,300 uh, described species in the world. Uh, many of those in the tropics and uh, new species still being found in the tropical areas. Um, as a matter of fact, a friend of mine uh, it's describing a species of uh, a damselfly that we found in Panama last year. Um, Oregon, we have 94 species. Uh, you certainly won't see all of those uh, because some of them are ones that have flown in from the south and you get one look at them and then they're gone and they don't, uh, you don't see them again next year and they don't tend to breed here. <clears throat> Let's talk about the life cycle. It's, uh, pretty complicated. They start off as eggs. These eggs are tiny, half a millimeter in length and uh, width. Uh, they're laid and in a couple weeks they hatch into these larvae. Uh, the larvae um, are uh, various shapes and sizes and we'll look at some of those in a minute, but they are all in water of course. And uh, when you don't see the adults like in the winter, they're all still there, but they're in the water in the ponds and streams and emerge in the spring. Spend time as a larva. When the larva uh, becomes mature, it crawls out onto uh, some plant stems, twigs, or sometimes up on a rock. And the, the larval skin splits down the back and out crawls this drab, wet-looking thing, uses blood pressure to blow its wings up and its abdomen, and I'll show you a slide of that in a minute. Um, and here's the adult uh, uh, phase uh, where they're, they're mating. Of course, uh, the adult phase is really all about eating, mating, and laying eggs. Uh, and the adults only live uh, probably about three weeks or so. And so most of their life is actually spent in the water as larva. And in mating, you may have seen these flying around in this wheel position, and they can fly like that. Uh, males are more brightly colored than the female, just like birds. Male grabs the female behind the head. She bends her abdomen up to the second abdominal segment of the male, and that's actually where the uh, business takes place. Uh, and here's some of the larval forms. These are all dragonflies on top, damselflies on the bottom, and they're a little more delicate. These are gills, so they're taking uh, oxygen out of the water with these gills. And uh, <clears throat> dragonflies actually have a rectal chamber, we call it, and there are gills in there. 
they pump water in and out and take oxygen out of the water uh, with those gills. Now here, I'm gonna show you a sequence of a, uh, a nymph that's crawled out of the water and is in the process of emerging. And you can see, this is actually the nymph. It's split down the back and here's the female crawling out. And it crawls out and then it's gonna blow its wings and its abdomen up with blood pressure, which is pretty amazing to be able to go from breathing with gills to breathing oxygen out of the air. And off we go into the wild blue yonder. And they fly away as quickly as they can because of course, when they're young and immature like that, they're pretty easily preyed upon by birds. So they'll fly off into a tree, sit around for uh, a bit until their bodies harden up and they'll start to develop uh, their more mature colors. And here's a mating sequence. This is a common white tail and it's mated with this female. And some of the males will do this. They're guarding the female while she lays the eggs to prevent other males from mating with her because of course uh, their goal is to pass on their genes and uh, he will guard her and guard her and, and drive off any other males that come around. And sometimes you'll find a whole group of, of dragonflies laying eggs and they congregate in a, in a spot and don't know how they choose that spot, but somehow it's, this happens to be a dried up wetland down near Drain, Oregon. And they're uh, just dropping eggs into all this grass and somehow they know or it's built into their DNA that those eggs will lay there for five or six months and then the fall rains will come and uh, those eggs will hatch when they are covered with water again and the process will start again. So the life cycle of this particular species only takes about five months probably. The rest of the time they're laying around as eggs in, this, in the dry soil. Come on. And uh, this is a group of damselflies and they're laying eggs over on the John Day River. This one's called the Amos Dancer. And the males uh, remain attached to the female damselflies while they lay eggs. The female has a sharp tip on the end of her abdomen, which uh, is we call an ovipositor. And they can pierce this plant stem and they lay eggs in the plant stem. When the eggs hatch, the larva crawl out and drop into the water. Of course, they're pretty protected inside of this uh, stem uh, because uh, one of the things, if you ever watch dragonflies very much laying eggs, there will be fish around and they're trying to uh, catch some of those eggs when they're laid into the water. The eyes, the eyes of these things are amazing. Uh, they uh, are compound, of course, and they essentially wrap around the head, front and back, and there are about 25,000 individual eyes uh, uh, on each side. And the odd thing to me is they have three single eyes up on top of the head. And you know, you always wonder if you got 50,000 eyes, what do you need three more for? But maybe they're used in orientation or something. Another thing is, that's interesting about the eyesight is, as you probably know, uh, humans see red, green, and blue, and combinations of those colors. Dragonflies see a lot more colors than we do. Um, in uh, looking at the um, light and color receptors in their eyes, they think that some species even see more than 30 different, I hate to call them colors because we don't see them, but they're in the ultraviolet spectrum, um, very short wavelength. Uh, so I always wonder, I see these dragonflies and they look beautiful to me, but what do the dragonflies see? Because they're seeing 30 or 40 colors. 
And of course, this is the last thing a fly sees. Um, now let's uh, just take a look. Uh, I'm gonna show you some photos. Mostly they're just the local species that we see around the Eugene Springfield area. There, we have about uh, 50 species actually that you can find just in the ponds and streams around Eugene. And I think we have uh, more than uh, they have up the valley uh, because we have, uh, of course, uh, the, the Willamette River and the McKenzie River all draining down to our area. So it's kind of a conduit for things moving up and down the river. This uh, is one that actually can be found right down at Mount Pisgah uh, on the uh, Coast Fork. It's called the American Ruby Spot. Probably one of the prettiest uh, damselflies in, uh, in North America has this beautiful red color uh, on the base of the wings. And when uh, the color on the upper part of the wing is actually brighter. So when it flies, you'll see this flashing red color. And uh, when I've taken classes down along the river, uh, these things are down there. And it's always interesting to me because we catch them and look at them and let them go. But uh, people down there swimming will come and see them and they'll, they'll ask like, where in the world did you find that? And it, so we don't notice unless we look, you know. And this is another one that's found right down there in the same area. And it's called the River Jewel Wing. And uh, I understand we have to find names for these things, but I think this thing could actually be called the River Jewel because the body is really bright uh, metallic green <clears throat> and it's a uh, refracted light. And so if you see the sun from on it from a different angle, it might look blue or uh, some combination of those colors. Gorgeous thing. Um, here's a troublesome group. <laughs> I just put them all on one screen for you. Uh, this one is pretty easy. It's called the Emerald Spread Wings wing. And these are damselflies. And we call them spread wings because they usually sit with their wings a little bit apart. Uh, but some of them, unfortunately, are very similar and you almost have to see them in hand to be able to tell them apart. Um, or if you have a very good pair of close focusing binoculars, you can sometimes tell them apart. Um, this one actually isn't found right in this area. This is one a friend and I found. Uh, it was a new record for Oregon. It's uh, over in the Wallawa uh, County area at wetlands over there. And it's called the Sweet Flag Spread Wing. This pretty little thing, it looks pretty spectacular, but it's only an inch long. So people don't often notice it. I, uh, there's a population of these actually right out on 18th Street at Willow Creek, um, just below the, the bridge there, a little ponded area, and you can find them there. Um, really pretty little thing. As I said, the males are brightly colored. Females are usually drabber colored. This is a female here, uh, more orangey looking. Another one we can find right down at Mount Pisgah this is called Emma's Dancer. It's the one I showed you with all the, uh, all of them laying eggs in that plant stem. Uh, really pretty um, lavender color and the male's more brown. Uh, these are perched up usually all over along the trails by the river at Mount Pisgah. Vivid Dancer, this is one that's found uh, pretty much all over town at any water body. Uh, real pretty blue. It's got these black arrowheads along the front part of the abdomen on the side here. And that's pretty characteristic. Uh, so if you see one with these arrowheads, that's what it is, Vivid Dancer. Here's a group of bluettes. Um, these blue ones are, again, a bit of a problem to identify. So most of the people I, I, I uh, show in classes uh, tend to just call them bluettes because you pretty much have to keep, catch them in hand and look at them with a hand lens, um, particularly the appendages on the back of the, the male back here to be able to tell them apart. So bluettes good enough. 
another common one found at ponds all over town. This one can be found even uh, in warm days in January and uh, February and into March. Um, real common down at uh, Delta Ponds uh, has these four little blue dots on the top of the black thorax. Uh, and the, the female is, again, uh, quite different colored, a little lighter colored, but the female has several different color forms too. So they can be difficult. I show some of those in the book, but uh, not all of them. Western Forktail, another common one around town, has this pretty green on the sides of the thorax. The female, is more this powdery gray color. Oh, this is spectacular uh, dragonfly. Um, and it's called Western River Cruising. Uncommon around town. Found on the, uh, the Coast Fork again down at Mount Pisgah, but uncommon and virtually never purchased. So you don't ever get a good look at it. But if you see something big and black and yellow flying, uh, usually. Uh, near the shore, up and down the river, that's one of these. And the males, uh, as with a lot of the males of dragonflies, patrol. They go up and down the river, and what are they doing? They're looking for females. Um, and the females tend to stay away from water until they're ready to mate, because uh, when they come down, they're going to be harassed by these guys. Uh, biggest dragonfly around town, Pretty common, called the common green darner. They don't look real if you catch them and look at them. This, this looks like it's made out of uh, some of that FEMO bead material, because it just looks plastic almost when you get it in hand. Really spectacular thing though, and quite large with particularly this thorax, it's just huge and probably used to power, you know, a lot of muscles to power these big wings. Blue-eyed darner, pretty common around town. Um, really beautiful thing. Has these forked appendages on the back. So if you see something sitting and it's got that, it's a blue-eyed darner. But you'll know it before that because uh, those beautiful blue eyes and that front of the face there is all blue. When they come down like Amazon Creek, if you're standing on one of the little bridges or something, you see those blue eyes coming at you from a long way away and they're just glowing. Really pretty. Uh, another one we can find down at uh, Mount Pisgah, and that's where this photo was taken, I believe. Um, they like to perch uh, on dirt or on rocks right along the river. It's called the Pacific Clubtail. Clubtail, because of this expanded tip on the end of the abdomen, often have little bright yellow spots there and along the top of the abdomen, uh, and really blue eyes. A really pretty thing, and I always look forward to showing that to uh, little uh, walks that I do along the river for Mount Pisgah. And this one's called the American Emerald because of these emerald eyes. And it, it can be found like uh, over at uh, Delta Ponds in the usually earlier in the year, like June. Later in the year, they tend to disappear. And this is a the emerald family is a pretty large family with a number of mountain species that we don't see down in the valley. But if you go up in the mountains, you'll see them uh, around lakes. They often, a lot of them have a real green thorax and even and a black uh, abdomen and even greener eyes. Really uh, pretty eyes. Um, who says we don't come up with it? with good names, dot-tailed white face. <laughs> uh, pretty simple name. Uh, and this is one that can be found uh, in boggy areas around ponds and lakes. Uh, a place you might find this would be like the fringes of uh, Fern Ridge where there's a lot of reeds and boggy areas. They like to perch on uh, floating leaves like in the water. You'll know them by this real white face and that single dot on the abdomen. Uh, another common one, often get asked about this one and people describe it with, with the one with all the black and white spots. 
and it's called an eight spotted skimmer. I have no idea why they decided just to count the black spots. Uh, you could easily call it the 16 spotted skimmer or something else. But uh, believe it or not, I belong to an organization that has a committee that names these things. And uh, it's, it's actually interesting. They have terrible arguments over what they're going to name something. <laughs> and uh, there are actually a couple of people I know who don't speak to each other anymore because they didn't get their way. Pretty silly. Uh, uh, this is the male. The female looks fairly different uh, because the male gets this powdery prunosity on it, we call it. Uh, and the female doesn't usually have the white spots, but looks somewhat similar. Called the widow skimmer, I think because of these black spots at the base of the wings and uh, this white, the white spots on the outer area too are characteristic. And this is, uh, has, has this prunosity, we call it, which can wear off. And uh, I always use this trick with people that I take out on walks. I know this male has mated. And how do I know? Well, see these spots that are wore off? That's where a female has grabbed on when they mate and form that wheel position. And this is a spectacular one. This is the biggest red thing we have around, really bright colored, common at the ponds around town now. Female is a little more orange colored. This is a ball of eggs the female has, which uh, when she flies away, she'll uh, drop down and dip and wash off into the water. And uh, if you've seen dragonflies dipping their as a little girl told me, drip, dipping their butts in the water, um, that's what they're doing. They're laying eggs. Uh, and this one uh, is a recent, relatively recent addition to Oregon. Um, I think I first saw the first one in 2012, and they moved up from the south. And now they're all the way up to the Portland area and probably will be crossing the river into Washington at some point, but they haven't yet. Uh, Blue Dasher, another very common one uh, at the ponds around town, likes to perch on sticks and twigs over open water near the edges of ponds. Has this powdery blue abdomen, a darker thorax with some lines, green eyes, a white face. The female has this broken yellow line along the top of the abdomen. And I only went into that detail because here's the Western pond hawk, which looks similar. But notice the face is greenish, doesn't have the dark side of the thorax. So you can tell them apart. And this is one when I first started looking at these things uh, some 25 years ago or so. Um, I found these green dragonflies that I assumed were the, a different species. But it turns out this is the female and this is the male. And this is a case where the female actually, I think, is br brighter than the male and uh, prettier colors too. Really uh, interesting. Common white tail. This is the one I showed you of the male guarding the female who is laying eggs. And you can see it has a really bright abdomen likes to perch on logs, uh, particularly laying along ponds, has this black flag wing pattern. Female doesn't have the white on the abdomen and uh, has these additional black spots. Can be confused with that eight-spotted skimmer that I showed you too. And now we get to a group that is troublesome too in identifying. These are uh, meadow hawks. We have, uh, you know, half a dozen species around town and they're all reddish colored and they're small. Um, and so they can be hard to tell apart. This one is relatively easy if you see it perched, which they do a lot because it's got these white spots on the abdomen surrounded by black. And a couple of little yellow dots 
down low on the thorax. And this is another middle hawk called the cardinal. Of course, like the cardinal, the bird, uh, really bright red. Can't see it, but if you can see the sides, it has a couple of real bright yellow spots in the side, red veins along the front of the wings. And it, it's interesting because it has a spring fall emergence. You don't see them so much during the middle of the summer, but there's some that emerge in the early spring and then some emerge later in the fall. And I actually have seen these uh, just uh, this past week. Black saddlebags. Uh, this is a, a big dragonfly um, and has these black, which they call saddlebags at the base of the wings, big broad wings. This thing flies and flies and flies and uh, usually flying up 10 feet or so, eight or 10 feet. So what I often see is a shadow on the ground from these black bags. And I look up and there they are flying around above me. I know you all hate to walk into those spider webs that are particularly common right now, but think about what the spider is thinking. If we pull this off, we'll eat like kings. And I uh, just, uh, I think I'll end with this one. Um, this is called a sapphire wing. And no, you don't see this here. Uh, this is a photograph I took in the highlands of Ecuador at a pond there. And these things are spectacular. They're not really very big, but they'll sit there and they do the signaling. We don't know what it means, but they'll raise the back wings up, straight up, and the front wings are down. And then they'll put them down and raise the front wings. And uh, they do that over and over again. And we think it's probably males somehow signaling uh, that that's their territory to other males. And here's a mountain sedge sprite. I told you that was the end and it is, but I'm just gonna tell you, there's a lot more of them up in the mountains that you can go see. Because I think we're at 1254. Thank you so much, Carrie. That some of those pictures are stunning. And I, I took a class at a walk at Pisgah a few years back. Are you still able to do that in person or do you do it virtually or what are you doing now? We're doing nothing now. They've canceled all of their events. Yeah. I do them for McKenzie River Trust too, and they've canceled all theirs also. So uh, we're looking forward to getting back at it, hopefully next year, but at some point. Um, the, the one at Pisgah was always really popular. Uh, yes. We usually filled it up and then some. So. Well, let's take a minute or two for questions and then I've got a little bit of wrap up. We still have a trivia question for you. Okay. But, uh, anybody have a question, Jean? Yeah, I have a question since you were mentioning the walks. Um, how would we, um, when you are able, when it, things open up and the walks start again, how will we access that information? Well, um, about the only way to do that would be to look at uh, at either uh, Pisgah's site or uh, McKinsey River Trust, their websites. They list all of their walks on there. Um, so, uh, okay. and I I will sometimes post them on Facebook, and but they put them on Facebook too. So that'd be probably the only way. Great, thanks. The register guard used to do that, but they don't seem to do that anymore. John, did you have a question? What What do the dragonflies eat uh, during their flying time? You didn't mention that. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry about that because that's really important. They eat insects, so they're great to have around. Um, people used to call them mosquito hawks, you know, oh. as one of the names. So both the both the larvae and the adults are, are completely uh, predators, you know. And so they're great things to have around. And um, friends, I have friends who have gardens, you know, that they don't use pesticides on. And they have a lot of dragonflies coming to their yards just to feed on the insects. Uh, Better way to keep the insects at bay. 
It is, and I've heard many strange stories. Um, um, a Chinese woman told me one time that when she was a child in China, uh, there were a lot of insects and they slept under um, a mosquito netting. And her mom would bring dragonflies in and put them under the mosquito netting. Huh. I somehow doubt that would work, but <laughs> they seem to think it did. Huh. Because they usually eat on the fly. If you watch them out in an open area and you watch their erratic flight, they're usually catching things. So they'll fly along and they, they zip up a bit and down and back and forth. Fascinating. 